Hey, hey, ho, ho. I don't want to rhyme, bro. Look, it is Tuesday, my friends. Tuesday, and the ladder hath recently reset. And we're going to do some tryharding, starting with this little Crocs and mid range grinder deck that we were playing yesterday. Um, I'm going to give more or less the same intro to this one as we did previously. Um, the, the, the main <clears throat> gist of this deck is fill up the graveyard so that we can cast Croxa from the grave, which is an extremely powerful card. Like, stupidly powerful. And also we have Phoenix of Ash as another very, very potent escape card. Excuse me, the fact that this is Flying Haste means that it's a good way to pick off um, Planeswalkers, which are pretty popular at the moment. So, um, what are some of the ways that we fill the graveyard? Meyer Triton. This is such an, a beast card. This is so good. Good lord, this is ridiculous. Meyer Triton, two mana, has Death Touch, handles a lot of blocking. It heals for two, and it puts two cards into the graveyard. Wonderful. Timurek Calls the Dead, another of our big graveyard fillers, fills it up. We can exile creatures or enchantments to make zombies. And then notice that third chapter, you gain X life and scry X, where X is the number of zombies you control. This is a zombie. We also have Ashiok as a very effective way to fill our own graveyard. If you target yourself, you put four cards of your library into the graveyard, and then you still exile the opponent's graveyard. And this is one of these like mental mismatches that can get you in trouble a little bit, where it's easy to go, oh yeah, Ashiok, target player, puts four in the bin, and then exiles their library. It's not the same player. It's always the opponent's library, excuse me, always the opponent's uh, graveyard gets exiled and you always get to target. So you can fill your graveyard and exile theirs at the same time. I did not get this card in the list at first, but this is, in a weird way, you can think of this card as creating card draw for you. Because the resources that you will spend to cast stuff from the graveyard are cards in the graveyard. So filling up the graveyard gives you extra opportunities to cast Croxa in Phoenix. So if you previously could cast Croxa once, and then you get Ashiok, and now you can cast Croxa two more times, it is as though you have drawn two Croxas. Uh, so this is, this is card draw. The rest are just tech cards that help do removal until you're stable. So we have Bone Crusher Giant for some of our cheap removal. We have Murderous Rider to destroy creatures and planeswalkers. Some Bedevils to destroy uh, artifacts, creatures, or planeswalkers. E to Extinction for the Exile effect. Very good against Anax. Very good against Uro. Very good against planeswalkers. Ember Cleave. We often sideboard this one out. Uh, but this is obviously a good way to punch through for damage. We have some of the anti-aggro tools in Disfigure, Red Cat Melee. Farica's Libation is a fascinating sideboard card. Target opponent sacrifices an enchantment. That second one. This hits Wilderness Reclamation. This hits Fires of Invention and other such things. And then we have some other controly Oleo tools, but it is so fun. It is so fun. I love this deck. Eats Metal says, I really like this. Uh, I really like Ab Augustus's idea. Does this deck have room for Claim the Firstborn to have a hasty Croxa? Maybe instead of Embercleave. Um, I don't really think it's even necessary or helpful. Um, I go first. I think this is okay, because I'm going to get two scries, and really I care about casting this on turn three. Perfect. Canal, this is a new sub here. Love your content, positivity, day and I. Why, thank you. Tis my mon plaisir. Um, I think I actually still want to go for Timurek Calls the Dead. Land is the most important thing here. Yeah, I, like, first of all, claim the Firstborn with no Croxa does not do anything. It's kind of useless. Um, you know, what am I going to take this, hit him, and then lose it again? I mean, it, it just doesn't have that much value. Uh, claim the Firstborn works really nice in decks. What did I click? Great. Um, claim the Firstborn works really nice in decks where you have sacrifice effects. So you can claim their creature and sacrifice it. And then sometimes also, you can claim the firstborn your own creatures for the purposes of hasting it. 
I will absolutely trade this away. If there is an aggro deck that uses footlight theme, Rakdos decks that use footlight tend to be uh, around sacrifices and multiples of creatures, so picking one off is extremely effective here. Maybe a Midnight Reaper or something like that. Mayhem Devil, you got it. Perfect. We're going to exile this. We're going to murder us right of this. And we're doing it on our turn to prevent any silliness from happening on our opponent's turn with sacrifices. Yeah, so, I mean, like, Claim the Firstborn doesn't have synergy with almost anything else that we're doing. Uh, and because it will only have synergy with one card, we'd have to say, is that synergy so incredible that it's worth it for just one card? And I think the answer is no, because we're already kicking ass and going for a very grindy recursion-style deck. Often my opponent runs out of cards in hand. I don't need them to very, very run out of cards in hand, you know. If they're running out, that's all there is to it. Butter gones. Okay. Don't want this. We're still looking for the land for Croxa. So uh, I think the simplest play is just to shoot this. I think I actually will keep this back. This deck runs a couple of the spectacle cards. Sometimes it runs drill bits, light up the stage, things like this. So I won't be able to block the butter guns. Okay. Have to block this anyway. Uh, discard does not hurt us. We're just going to hope that Web KPD draws a card as well. Great. Each player discards a card. No problem. I'll put the Phoenix of Ash in the bin. This is kind of annoying. But, you know, it's fine. I'm doing a lot of this stuff on my turn. Because uh, there's a lot of, like, weird sacrifice effects that can happen on their turn. By the way, T. Sully, cheers to you for 107 months in a row. Since a paper my lab submitted in September 2018 was finally published yesterday. Fuck yeah! That's the way that shit works! That's the way that shit works, man! Oh my god! Yes, please. I actually want lots of mana right now. I'm gonna go ahead and bedevil it now, again. I probably could have waited, but they only have one card left in the hand, so I'm about to, like, dominate. Alright. Uh, Web KPD is, is more than likely going to concede uh, right when I just slam Croxa. We're typically trying to uh, exile Planeswalkers, Spells, and Lands because Timoret Calls the Dead exiles creatures and enchantments to make zombies. God, that's so cool that you got your paper published, man. Um... Lawrence says, this sort of Grixis deck looks fun. Ashiok is an optical illusion. We're actually pure Rakdos here. Kind of a bumpy start, and we still slammed, huh? Pretty dope. So, how do we think that we win this? I think that... Um... I, 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 again, I'm not 100% that the Embercleave is even necessary in the main deck. Uh, but I, I think I want to have a lot of removal because there's a lot of combo-y kind of things that go on with this deck. Do I want a, a Disfigure or a Farica's Libation? Bedevil hits the uh, Witch's Oven, which I just remembered recently. I'm going to put in the Disfigure. It's instant speed. We've seen Murderous Rider, Priest of the Forgotten Gods, Gutter Bones. We saw Witch's Oven, which implies that there will be 
A pesky, obnoxious bastard cat. What do we think about Ashiok Dream Render? I think it's okay here. It's not spectacular, but I think it's okay. Possum Socks is one minor downside if Libation is that it activates some of their sacrifice engines. Super true. Super true. It's kind of why I chose to go with the... Um, Typically, I, I like to get more cheap cards in from the sideboard if I have a choice. I think this is a great hand. We have our one copy of our turn one do stuff card. We have another thing that can uh, ping for two. If this is sack play thing, Priest of Forgotten Gods, we get to pick it off. I actually, this is so good, I might actually remove an Eat to Extinction and put in a second disfigure. I mean, this feels really nice. Get the fuck out of my game. Yeah, deal negative one damage to whatever target you want, my friend. Show me what you got. It's probably the one to get rid of, huh? My opponent is likely going to be going on the following turn, land Midnight Reaper. And I think I still Agonizing Remorse. And then I can maybe get to four mana and eat to Extinction the Midnight Reaper for no draws. I think I'd rather do this again still. Rankle Master of Ankles, huh? Yeah, that's that's a pretty good one to get out. Alright. Well, this is this is a wee bit painful. Whoa shit. Alright. Sacrifice it. This is a really awkward situation to be in. I mean, getting one Lando Calrissian would be super helpful. It's kind of nice that the Bone Crusher Giant um, fizzled and went to the bin, because now I have a guaranteed uh, exile with Tim Rett Calls the Dead. Oh! Oh! This is so shitty. I think I might just lose because I didn't hit the Lando Calrissians. Aotus, is you planning on doing another stream on Factorio? Well, guess what, Aotus? I have a full week planned in the third week of March. Third week of March. Third week of March. If I don't draw land, I am dead. Okay. one of these, put in one of these. I think that's it. Boop. Does the deck seem to need more lands? Or do we just need to uh, mulligan more aggressively? Um, I mean, that was one match where we were stuck on two land, which just happens. We have 25 land. I mean, that's, uh, that's a very acceptable amount of land to have. Silva says, what's your favorite meta of MTGA so far? This one or uh, the Guilds of Ravnica release? I really love Silvos. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Temple of Malice, corner pocket. Snarly Barley Boo. Dum, dum, bum, ba, dum, bum, bum. Try to hoard butcher. This is the father of the rich. Oh yeah. The rich. Oh yeah. I don't need another croxa. I'm I'm gonna main phase all my instant speed spells like a true badass. That's the way that I am going to do it. Ooh, you love to see it. All right, because now what I can do is I can crack for a black mana. I can play Timurek Calls the Dead, which will put three into the bin. Doink, doink, doink. I can exile this one. Next turn, I then get to hard cast Croxa. Now, actually, I'm going to leave this one up. Plexical. Hey, what's going on, man? 82 months. Hot damn. I think it's going to be each player discards a card, each player draws a card. Twinkle, twinkle, rankle man. Concede this game as fast as you can. Nothing. Declination commencing. One, two, three, four, and five. Bam, 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 bam. Look at the absolute baby. Look at just the, the, the myrtle, the myrtle juice happening right now. This is this is just a positive time in life. Bam! Look at that pain. Let's be a little bit more diligent about doing stuff not on our main phase. <laughs> Boob keeper. It says have a good Tuesday. Keep your boobs safe, guys. You got it, boob keeper. I'm I'm keeping mine nice and safe by eating chicken sandwiches on the regular. I, I I did run today. We did it. We ran yesterday. We ran today. Not far. Not far at all. But just ran a little bit. Ninbuffin says, why do you exile those certain cards? Because Timret Calls the Dead says, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. Then you may exile creature or enchantment cards from your graveyard. So in the graveyard, I'm looking for the uh, instant speed, sorcery speed things and lands to get exiled first. Because if there is a creature that's left over, then I can play a Timret Calls the Dead and guarantee that it has an exile target to be able to exile a creature or enchantment. So, basically, creatures and enchantments are exiled last from the graveyard. Spells and shit are exiled first. Did you rank down? Uh, you can't rank down in this game. They just reset the ladder, Meyer the Great. You want me to draw a little old card? Well, thank you. Oh, beat the bedevil out of it. <sighs> yeah. I hate to say it, but I'm the first player in history that's ever ranked down. It's hard. Boop, boop, boop. Is there maybe something double red that Web KPD can't cast? Oh yeah, 
I want that one right on the top. Okay, let's do this. Show me what's in that hand. <laughs> There's this thing about Croxa that makes it actually so sick. Which is that... You just wind up with so many things that don't hit it. Epic Downfall, mana cost three or greater, doesn't hit it. Elspeth Conquers Death, Exile, something that costs three or more, doesn't hit it. And everyone always forgets the Elspeth one because it costs four to cast from the grave. So it's easy to mentally go, oh, this is a four cost card, but it's a two cost card. Thanks. Concession commencing. I mean, this deck just beats. I mean, I expect an exploding Jason in a, in a matter of seconds. Look at this, Web KPD. Yeah, the Great says, uh, don't you stay mythic when you become mythic? Um, when you hit mythic, you can no longer become unmythic for the duration of that season. But when the season resets, it just drops everybody back down again. Ban Rainer says, I just learned that you can use Claim the Firstborn on your own creatures to give it haste. Uh, yeah, for any of you who don't know, Claim the Firstborn says, uh, gain control of target creature with cost three or less until end of turn. Untap it, give it haste. Um, so you can use it on one of your creatures to untap and give it haste. Um, two, two things. First of all, what other synergies does Claim the Firstborn have with our own stuff? If we have sacrifice effects, we can claim one of their things, sacrifice it, do something with it. We don't have any of those. We essentially just have some sexy beaters. And our sexy beaters... Our sexy beaters are just Croxa. The Phoenix already has haste. That's really the only one. Uh, and we have no sacrifice synergy, so we don't really have a lot of synergy outside of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's hard for me to see a circumstance in which it would have other use outside of Croxa Inc. And then in terms of being able to hit stuff from the other persons, I mean, we're going to steal it for a turn and then we're not really going to be able to do much with it. So it, it doesn't seem particularly useful. Use it on your own Bone Crusher for creative Sudoku. Yeah, it, it, so it, it doesn't really seem to hurt the enemy as much either. So... We also expect Clown Baby to send one back with the Brazen Borrower, which is fine. We, we really don't, we really don't particularly care. Ooh. Okay, so this is not Teamer Adventures, because Teamer Adventures does not run Uro, Titan of Nature's Wath. Let's just get a Croxa in the bin, shall we? No! Fuck! <laughs> I'm gonna crack it now because I want to pay attention to chat instead of passing my turns. Someone knows how to have a good time. What on earth is this? Spell costs one less to cast for each artifact you control. Okay, it's broken in modern. When Emery Lurker the Lock enters the battlefield, put the top four cards in the graveyard, choose an artifact, and what on earth in the actual ass are we seeing here? Yeah, that's actually really good, isn't it? So this, this looks like Clown Baby is is very eager and interested in having a good time. And we're gonna we're gonna just try to prevent that from ever happening. So the next most likely play from Clown Baby is going to be casting Uro due to the graveyard being filled up with stuff. 
Therefore, with six mana, we can play the Mire Triton and eat to extinction the Uro and bonk the face. Th th this is the most likely play. I it's possible that Clown Baby does something different, but with a name like Clown Baby, we would expect standard and intelligible play. <laughs> Look who's thinking with portals. Oh. Shit. What? Damn. This really blows that that's the one that's out. My brain is a very good card. What about Brawl? I, I may very well do uh, cover some Brawl vids. Um, maybe do Brawl once one Wednesday. I just, I just don't have that much interest in Brawl right now. I really do want to try. I'm trying to do, try out some of the other modes. On uh, Monday the 16th, I'm going to be playing Historic for a few hours. So I want to look at at least one of the top decks and then make at least one Zakama deck. Oh! Clown Baby is growing out of control. What a bad Clown Baby. Dum, 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 dum. Holy shit. Doing this. Damn. Um, I'm doing this Timurit Calls the Dead on the top of the deck because it really increases the chance that I can hit a Croxa. Because in the top half of our deck, we've we've yet to see a Croxa or a Phoenix. So we have eight escape cards that we haven't hit in half the deck, which which sucks a little bit. Speaking of sucks a little bit, <laughs> fuck. gonna get out of this pickle, huh? Yeah! <laughs> yes! Victory! Oh my god, our Wombed Apprentice dumped a bunch of stuff into the bin! And we got a Croxa! Uh, so I think that we we might we might just lose this game immediately. We we'll have to spend a little bit of time thinking about the proper way to win against this. This is uh, can't tackle this defending player has seven or more cards in their graveyard. Can't block unless you have four more cards in your hand. So this will never be able to block. We have a lot of cards in the graveyard, so this can swing. And we're about to gain three life. So I mean, I'm just gonna have to continue to beat down. I'll continue to beat down. Whew. Stone Coil Serpent. Are we kidding me? I don't know why decks run Stone Coil Serpent. This is like a bad card, right? This is like not a good card. Am I wrong on this evaluation? It's so evaluation axiom. I 
think that I think that we're fucked in this particular situation because there's three of these things out that we can't actually do anything about. Okay, never mind. I forgot that I put Embercleave in this deck. Mass pretty tight. No, no, maybe no. Probably that one. Six and six. Protection from multicolored, so this won't deal any damage. Leave back Team Chumps. I really think that my opponent is going to eventually just get Thassa's Oracle and just blow me up. So that dies for sure. That dies. Alright, nifty. I did some damage. So we, we do pose a little bit of a threat. Uh, depending upon what Clown Baby does this turn, I think we might have to concede. Like, that really shits on us. I think this deck actually just... Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just going to get out. I'm just going to get out of here. The opponent's going to heal up, like, so high. Would we have won if we cleaved on Croxa? No, because the uh, Stone Coil Serpent that we were uh, attacking into has protection from multicolored, so Croxa deals zero damage to it. All the damage gets prevented. Um, so, what do we wish to do here? What is the key? Ashiox are going to be very good. Bone Crusher Giants, still pretty good. Um, let's see here. I think we need just a lot of our removally doovally things. This is going to be very nice. Um, Kind of want to bedevil in there as well. This might be the card that gets cut, huh? Maybe this one. When the trample have gone through? Uh, no, what happens is the first round of combat damage is assigned fully to Crocs or assigned fully to the Stone Coil Serpent. Then when that damage occurs, it is prevented due to protection. Um, so Part of me actually thinks that this this is the right thing to cut. I think I actually cut that puppy. I think the disfigures are actually going to be very high value in this circumstance. So the question is, with that one remaining slot, what do we put in? I think an Ashiok seems fine. I think that's, that's the one. Great. Looks good. Have a variety of two mana plays. We have a Croxa. We have a Croxa Enabler. Yeah, yeah. W w with the double strike, that's correct. If, if let's say, because um, the way that we intuitively process double strike is, let's say I have seven damage with double strike against an eight toughness creature with protection. Oh, look at this. Look at, look at the teamwork going on here. Milling the cards for me that would get in the way of my land draws? Thanks, Clown Baby. Now I might be able to just go land, 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 and just like Croxa. Ooh, you hate to see that. I do want to get this in the bin, for sure. But yeah, it, what happens is we intuitively would go, oh, 7 plus 7 is 14, so 8 would be protected from that, so 6 would get through. But that's not exactly how it works mechanically. What winds up functioning is... Uh, you love to see it. How do I want to do this? I want to hit a land drop. So what is the most effective way to do that? If I bin first... 
Okay, so if I do this first, this increases the probability of hitting. This increases the probability that I put non-lands in. Oh, fuck me. Okay, that sucks. Whatever. Anyways. If we draw a red land source, we can cross it right away. Ba-bam. Anyways, uh, with double strike, what happens is intuitively we say 14 damage is going to go through with double strike, and then that's protected. So that means. Um, I think it's fine to take. I need to kill these guys, like, super ASAP. What happens is the first seven of the first strike damage gets assigned to the creature with protection, it gets prevented. So then the second seven from the from the double strike occurs. That second seven again gets assigned to the creature with protection, and then that again also gets protect or prevented. So Die Clown Baby. This deck is hilarious. It also like has a really negative interaction with our deck that's trying to constantly fill our own graveyard. Vantress Gargoyle winds up being a real beating. How many turns can we live here? I think we have to let this through and go down again. No thanks. Thing in a bomb. Zoinks. Like, hey, Scoob. Kill this. Still more important. And uh, if we cast Croxa, we right now have nine cards in the bin. So that will remove six total from the bin. So we'll have three. So this turns off the Vantress Gargoyle. Am I not flush with the bottom? No, it looks like I'm flush with the bottom. Who's that? It's Despy! Despy the cat. Oh, Sheriff's cooking. Hi, good looking. Hi, Desper. Oh, somebody was on the heating pad. Someone was a little cooking mama, huh? So we're going to need to probably bedevil this. No blocks. My name is Sean and I am boring. I have to do this now because there's an Aether Gust in hand, so it would get gusted. Rambunctious, what are you talking about? I don't know. Where's the visual distortion happening? And be be super duper specific. that out of there. Things, things look good to me, man. Ah! Cuteman says, how much have you dived into database management systems? Absolutely motherfucking none, baby. Uh, so we just die no matter what. Okay. Clown Baby's deck is a weird deck that is like perfectly positioned to shit on us. Say the video's torn. Take a screenshot. Take a little screenshot of it. Take a little screen shitty shotty. An itty bitty screeny shitty shooty. <laughs> Donk two lands in the bin, which sucks. Uh, the lands that go into the graveyard are essentially irrelevant. Essentially irrelevant. Go first. Open and looks good to me. Now, entropy. If you're if you're suggesting that I have a way to conclude that I have regret, then yes, I have regret. Dren says deck needs like six man total make place. You need precisely four mana. Precisely four. Not much more. So we're gonna mire Triton here. Four is the magic number. Um, 
and we we've been winning the only one that we lost against was a deck that like hyper super fucking duper counters us so great no big deal I was curious about the database management system questions. Yeah, no, I, I, I know nothing about database management. Do I block here to prevent one? Like this? I think so. I think that makes sense. These are getting super cut. I cut this a lot. I might just get it out. Oh, It's an argument to be made for not putting that bone crusher down, but it's fine. This is a good wall. is I think the best play to do where we do this put our own stuff in the bin there he is yep link me the pick send me the pick just paste it right in chat the bottom few pixels are destroyed here you know let me just move this around let me actually see if yeah it's taking up the whole screen There was no... Okay. I assume that there was an Emberclave, so... Block this one. Yep, that is... That's on the Twitch end. That's not my end. Uh, also, some of your browser settings are, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's not not an issue on my end. Certainly, I've I've never made a single mistake while streaming ever in my entire career, and I'm offended that you would ever suggest that. <laughs> I'm really, really sick of that you would say that. To be honest, I cannot tell why. All right, hang for a turn. Now, if I swing out, yeah, actually, maybe a swing would have been good there, because we're at twelve. We have like one billion healths. So my opponent will be at 14 naturally, so uh, yeah. Now if I play this Phoenix of Ash and then swing in, we don't have enough to play the Ember Cleaves. All right, let's just swingy-dingy on any. And see, see what happens. Uh, if my opponent doesn't block Croxa at all, we win. Because we're going to double strike for a total of 14 damage. Whoops! Whoops! I passed right through the win condition. Oh my god! I literally just hit the button. Did you, I literally announce what I was gonna do? Man, fuck! Get into the bin. I hit. I I said the play. Fuck! I hate it when I do that, man. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Which gets prevented. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Great. <sighs> All right, 
Ember Cleaves go, Ashiok Dream Render goes. I really think these Ember Cleaves might be cuttable from the from the deck entirely. So we cut those pup ease. Now we want to get the disc figures in. 1000 poison. Red Cat Melees, and I don't think I really need anything else. This is weak, because if I ask my opponent to sack a creature, they can have 1-1s one from Annex. Bedevil is a solid enough card, but uh, it's, it's hard for me to necessarily make a cut. Maybe I could actually cut the Phoenix of Ash. That's actually probably a good cut. Phoenix of Ash sucks in this matchup. Ethereka's Libation has extremely limited value. It, it can be anti-value, like I just make my opponent sack a Seder. Excuse me. So, question is, should I play the Mire Triton or the Agonizing Remorse? We saw no play with two mountains down, which would indicate that there's no additional one drops. There is plausibly a Bone Crusher. There's no Runaway Steamkins. The big thing we're worried about is Anax. So we're going to expect an Anax when we look. Oh, that is fucking hilarious. It's not going to do a lot. Let's get just the big boy out, huh? Is Factoria week confirmed? Indeed, Ravri. The week of the 16th. On the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th, I will be doing full day. Ever had long hair down to your shoulders? No. Oh, and, and I don't want to. Please, never speak of it again. All right, let's let's place some things into the graveyard. Kados is 13th as Ori, right? 11th as Ori. And we are playing 11, 12, 13th Ori. So we're only doing a Monday of Magic on the 16th. And the week after that is what the deck? Hit me, baby. Make me cry a little, baby. Ouch. Okay, so first things first. Show me what you got. What's in here, man? Let's take a peek. No Anax, no Torbrand. Probably uh, another Ember Cleave, some more removals. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a dead dude. Yeah, I would look so stupid with long hair because I'm balding up at the top. So I'd be one of those people that just tried to shift the overall center of gravity of the hair to the back with the ponytail. Got anything for me? No. Yeah, I think that I think that would look horrible. I think that'd look terrible. Time to get a mohawk. Yeah, that would also I just I'm not into any of the things that involve me looking in, in any way, like anything. Look at this. No no lava coils or red cat melees. We're gonna win with Meyer Tritons and zombies, man. Let me tell you. Truth be told. Don't disparage the dungeon master haircut, says entropy. Hoo-hoo. <laughs> oh yeah.
Hey, Bomb Rupel! Raided with 334 people. Hello. Kind Rupelier. Look at this. With the goal only to be able to hit Croc, so. I'm telling you, we're winning with zombies here, man. This, I think, is a huge benefit that we can hit with this deck that is not, like, a true benefit, but it, it's kind of, like, one that I'm happy exists, which is that I think a lot of people incorrectly sideboard against this. They treat it as an aggro deck when really we're much more of a mid-range deck. We're really much more of control a little bit and then just start pumping some powerful value cards out with recursion and re-enabling those. So really things that focus on exile effects, uh, graveyard removal, things like that, those are going to be the more targeted answers to our deck. But people tend to board in way too much removal and then I just eliminate their entire hand they have no strength just he's a very concerned streaming poker i just don't think poker is as interesting of a game to me uh anymore the sort of uh statistical analysis is incredibly time consuming and incredibly subtle and i don't think makes for particularly good streaming This is a bit of an agonizing position. This is cute to see the Goblin Banneret. Really love this card. It was wonderful in draft. When we see a Rimrock Knight played this aggressively, I I'm really worried about Anax, like a nice curve out. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick that off. Okay, so this is the aggro variant. Got it. We're, we're in pretty dire straits right now. Um, what, 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 what? Why not go for the Infuriate play? Get 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 y'all real swole up, huh? So I think our opponent has lethal. One, uh, three, and three is six. Six and four is ten. Buff, Infuriate, uh, Spit. Oh, 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 you didn't do it. Okay, tight. Nice. Okay. Uh, alright. Well, I'll do it. So, Renner says, how do you decide when to mulligan? Sometimes I'm not sure which hand to keep. Any advice? I I'm a big believer in the have a plan, and then that way you can make uh, objective statements about how you wish to shift that plan. I'm gonna cut one of these. E no, I think I really want the exile effects. Whatever this. Is oh, oh! I remember. I cut the phoenix. Damn it! Yeah, like if you say I always need to go for this card when I mulligan. Like say for this deck, I might say I will always keep if I have a Meyer Triton. And then I'll just do that until I get shot in the foot. And then I will have a more concrete statement. Ah, I kept the Meyer Triton hand, and the problem this hand had was blah. This is okay, but it's not great. Uh, I think the, the, the only way you can go wrong is if you don't make a statement to yourself about what you're trying to do. This is one of the best possible runouts. If I can get any land, any land off the top here is the Stone Cold Nuts. Great.
We have some, some axe hardening going on. Damn, we whiffed a land. Fuck. Let's go ahead and destroy this before their turn. Yep, it'll summon one of those little bastards. Not a big deal. We're one land away from Croxa and uh, Eta Extinction, which is a real beating. Yeah, Infuriate will pick these off. Or we just get a free dude. No problem. You got it. <laughs> okay. You got it, bud. Fuck and fuck. No and no. Cheese us. Holy cheese us. Chucky cheese us. Okay, here, here's what I think. I think that this is the correct play. Because spending four total mana to do this, to clear this out, only causes us five points of pain. Gets rid of these little guys, which increases the cost. Oh, my God. Oh, thank you, good Nessie. All right, so now we can ditch a... Uh, uh, Crocs, I don't want that many Croxes, man. Now, if I play the Croxa and there's a swing into Ember Cleave, what happens? This is... I think this is fine. Because it, it puts my opponent in the position where my opponent must... Must have an Ember Cleave in hand or bust. And even if that happens, the total devotion that this will have is four. Maybe it's good that I did this in this order. Maybe this is good. It's unclear to me what this is about. I think that's the play right there. Presume some kind of infuriate. Play this to get rid of everything in the hand. I think a more traditional red deck, I'd be actually uh, stronger against. This super go under you deck that has like infuriates and stuff, I think is a bit of a pain. Hey, what do you know? It wasn't infuriate. Good read last turn, man. I'm the best. All right, looks like we're just getting swung in the face, huh? Perfect. Perfect, perfect. What a toppy top deck that was. Doink, doink. Healing. Doink, doink. Healing. gets deleted. Okie dokie. Well, I guess that's the video game. Doctor of Time has done it. 
I don't actually think there's anything that I need to substantially change uh, about that. Th that style of red deck, the ones that run lots of infuriates, has a lot of stability problems where it can obviously punch huge, which is what happened in that game. It's got really nice combos going. Uh, but it doesn't have as much ability to stabilize if they don't hit it, so... Be on that play, babe. That play, babe. Seems as reasonable a choice as any. I'm, s I'm not super sold on this Ember Cleave. It, it, it has done work. It has not done nothing. Um, yeah, what are the top decks right now, Assay Otis? Um, yeah, it doesn't really matter. My, my opponent will probably get out the Ember Cleave. Thinking that we're a more aggressive Ember Cleaving deck when we're, we're not really. But um, in terms of what are the top decks right now, what do they what do they look like? Um, the let's get a Crocs in the bin, huh? Woo, fuck! It around the time of the uh, World Championship, it was Red Deck wins, Azorius control, Team of Reclamation, and to a slightly lesser extent, Jeskai fires. Those were considered like the decks. There uh, was the rise of Team of Adventures, which I just genuinely think was not on the radar of a lot of pros. Uh, and then once it got on the radar due to the win at DreamHack, Once it did get that win at DreamHack, a lot of pros started to play that list. Uh, Huey Jensen streamed himself uh, playing that deck for like a week. Luis Scott Vargas then took the list and went 10-0 in the Mythic Championship Qualifier. A lot of stuff like this going down. I'm going to go for Redlands right now because I have a lot of Phoenixes. So since, um, since Teamer Adventures has become very, very, very popular, there has been a pretty big rise in... Um, actually, maybe the correct thing to do is to swing and then play the 3-3 Phoenix post-combat, but, you know, whatever. Um, it doesn't matter particularly much. After the Teamer Adventures list came up, that shits on Azorius Control and is very, very good against Mono Red, so there's been kind of a, a, a flurry of attempts to explore different ideas. And this Sultai Ramp list, I believe that this is Andrea Mengucci's Sultai Ramp list, started to make a rise. This Rakdos uh, style has been uh, getting kind of popular, honestly. The, the, the meta has been very thrown out of whack in the last two weeks as a result. Sultai Ramp list. Very fun. We, we hit Mythic with it last month. 
It's a very, very solid list. Main decks, Aether Gust, Lameo. Okay, let's make some boarding decisions. I don't think... Embercleave is a stalemate breaker. I've not really found stalemates to be a thing that happens very much um, in this particular matchup. Ashiok is very strong. Obviously, Nox Noxious Grasp is very strong. I kind of like Liliana in this matchup as well, because there's limited amounts of big creatures that we want to get sacrificed. Bone Crushers actually super suck here. Bone Crushers suck because lands have 3-3 three, three toughness. A lot of the big creatures like Uro have more than two. Hydroid Krasis has more than two. Yeah, that looks good. I, I gotta give proper credit. M MTG Dreamhack winner. MTGA Dreamhack winner. Aaron Gertler, that's right. Oh, dude, Aaron Gertler is so articulate. Streamed uh, a bunch of the his Team or Adventures list and was like a huge proponent of was writing about it a lot. Just, a, just an amazing job. Explaining and elucidating the elements of the strategy. It was, it was so tight. I alas alack, I actually think that some of the Grixis shit is, is actually has some real legs. I genuinely think it does have some real legs, those Grixis lists. <laughs> well, doesn't this just suck? Boop, boop, boop. Timurit weeps for the dead. Yeah, spend that whole turn on that. Now let's top deck a black land. Black land off the top one time. Untap, upkeep, black land. Oh. oh show me what you got. Crisis, crisis, enter the god eternals. How much is in the graveyard? Not enough for us to be frightened. Kind of having a, a spiffy whiffy time here. You got it. Oh, quel relèvement! Alright, th this is, like, one activation of this is actually fine. This is actually fine. You put away your cards. Bam, 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 bam. It's me, Croxa. I'm so fucking sick. Everything's gone. Beer, 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 beer. Sweet. This is gonna die immediately, but that's fine. I think Manguchi's Sultai Ram deck is, is actually very, very strong. Wooshy, <laughs> no problem. 
Oh my god, look at this. Look at this beautiful swell of cards. Oh yeah. A one, and a two, and a three, and a four, and a five. Actually, these five are great. Da, 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 da. Dude, is Crocs a not just incredible? Is Crocs a not just a fantastic card? I think it's very hard to get a shell around Crocs that works, but this shell feels really nice. I'm hoping to beat the bedevil out of it. All right, well, that's our show. <laughs> Fuck. Ah! We are losing pretty badly, and it's making me feel bad, sad, bad. I think Kaus just actually has myrtled us. Has herded and murdered and uh You know, I'm just gonna I'm gonna concede. And the the, the little question I am going to be trying to answer is if I cut Embercleave, what would I put in? If I'm cutting this, like I like a lot of the other cards. And I feel uh, that are in this list. And I'm trying to identify what would maybe be a good thing to add. For instance, why not Bedevil or Rider them? Uh, uh, Bedevil and uh, Rider are double black. Uh, and I only had three black, so I could have only cast one. I could only have cast one. I actually think Rankle is the right one. Rankle feels pretty good. I think this I think this is a good one. I think that's right. I think that's right. And, and here's my reasoning for it. Um in terms of what we've been doing with our sideboards, we've been wanting to remove the Embercleave a lot, particularly against aggressive decks or decks where we are not looking to just burst with some damage. I want something that actually has a little bit more utility in there. So Rankle costs about the same-ish amount as an Embercleave would. We can do it kind of at the same at the same times. Um, but this also allows us to get rid of some pesky large creatures. Uh, again, same thing as Embercleave. It can also attack the hand, which a lot of our deck is built around. Um, adjust the mana base tag. Just got double red for double black. I think the mana base looks good. I think, you know, we're, we're pretty even evenly split down the middle with an extra skew towards black. So this looks this looks correct. We have, we have a sort of an equally sharp demand for double red and double black in this deck. So I don't think we really need to adjust too much. Also, I think that we would want, want to be cutting Rankle in, in our sideboarding plan, so in this way I don't really need to adjust my sideboard. Yeah, because we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 dual lands, then we have the four Fabled Passages, and then we do six Swamps, six Mountains, and one um, Black Castle. You have one double red and four double blacks. Uh, depends on how you're counting. We have the Phoenix, which is double red. And those uh, in the bin or on the board will be double red. We also have Croxa, which is our essential double red. So we need double red a lot. Uh, double red, double black on turn four. So we have a lot of pressure with our card selection to ensure that we have a very, very close to even mana base. And um, we, we don't actually need sharp skew. Towards um, one of the other, which you need to have a lot of both. If it's a four cost double black, I mean that's that's honestly pretty, um, pretty okay. Oh well, fuck a duck. What do we do about this shit, huh? Gonna have to probably get rid of thought erasure. Yeah, 
Yeah, so uh, it, long story short, I definitely don't think we want to cut any more of the red. Given that we have a three cost double red. We also have three cost double black, so we gotta be pretty careful. Super not a problem. Not a problem. Fuck you. Yeah. Righteous Bruce's, you have two three cost double blacks. Um, when you do your math, make sure you're, you're counting duplicates, because if I have like two bedevils, that's two double blacks. Um. Because we have five cards, as far as I remember, that are double black at three, and four cards that have double red at three. Bounce this. That's more like it. No. <gasps> how, how, how do I want to do this? Is it Crocs a time? Bone crushing time? So we have seven double blacks at three mana. Because I forgot the Ashiox, and then we have four double reds. So yeah, yeah, it looks like our mana base is good. Looks like our mana base is good. Because if you go to Frank Karsten Mana Calculator. And away he goes. I think I think I just want to discard a card here, right? Because this will help fill the bin. I think I should have shocked and land or played the swamp so that way I could use the Castle Lockthwain. Let's see, because in a 60 card deck, if we are trying to hit a uh, one color color on turn three, we need 18 sources, and I think we have that. We have four, 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 six. Four, four, and six is 10. So yeah, we have exactly 18. Yeah, so it looks good. Good. <laughs> you got it, man. Alright, so if we get a Timoret, that'd be very nice. Cavalier Flames in this deck. I have pretty negative feelings about Cavalier Flames uh, in this deck. Um, it's such an expensive card. It's so expensive. And our, I mean, our deck is pretty inexpensive. Um, it uh, is our hand filling up frequently with lots and lots of junk. Not really. So it wouldn't be useful for the cycle. I mean, it's a very good red card. And I, I kind of feel like I want another really good juicy 
card like that. I'm going to cast Bedevil now because this guarantees that I have enough in the bin for Croxa. I'm playing the Ox. I am not. I am not Oxing it. I don't want to discard anything else. I mean, Dance of the Mance actually just takes a shit on us right now. We did not quite pop off the way in which I want to pop off. Pimp F. I didn't pimp F. I find that this deck doesn't really need card draw. sucks. Like, this is the first time where I've needed card draw, because I have not had anything to play. No. <laughs> oh my god, Jeff Hoagland just hosted us. Ho Holy Hoaglandia. Shout out to Jeff Hoagland, the stream on which I saw this particular decoroni. Oh, you love to see that. Mm. Mm -mm 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 mm. I'm in the mood to have each player disco a card. I don't know if you're here, Mr. Hoagland, but I wanted to ask about your thoughts. I like a good I wanted to ask about your thoughts, Jeff, on cutting Embercleave. I'll be back. You better watch your back from here on out. And replacing Embercleave with a Rankle. I cut the Embercleaves and put in a Rankle. And that, that, that's really the only difference between this and the other deck there. We did Doth C. Mm. I'm going to do it because there is a 0% chance we put another Croxa in there. Yeah, I... The Ember Cleaves felt like something I wound up cutting all the time. Right I was just non-stop cutting the Ember Cleave. What happened to Factorio? Who's good boy? Week of the 16th, we're doing it for a full week. That's what happened to it. Or I should say more specifically, nothing happened to it. Let's see if our opponent bounces this, thinking that it will force us to do anything different. Oh my god, Stefano's thinking with portals. Oh! Holy shit! We are listen. I think I think we lost this game. This is an anti Sean plot deck. Look at this. We have we have multiple copies of Kaya in the main board. We have Legion's End in the main board. Is this deck becoming more popular? Goodbye, Rankle. Do I have enough mana for everything that I want to do? It looks like it. One, two, three. Okay, so then we have five in the bin, so I can get rid of the Rankle. I can then play the Croxa, which bickety bonks for a bit of damage. Replay Croxa. One, two, three, four, five. Four, four, five. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to find something else to do with that Embercleave slot that's a little bit more juicy. One of the nice things about Rankle is that it slightly helps Timuret. Um, does various things to the dead. Be a land, Stefano. Be a land. Oh, God. Stefano, that's taken a long time. Thank you, the stars. How many cards do we have in exile? We have 23 cards in exile, so this is actually pretty bad for us. Bye -bye. 
Bye. Oh. One, two, three, four, five, six. Bang. Boom. Uh. Uh. you hope to replace Embercleave with? Well, what we have done is we have replaced Embercleave with Rankle Master of uh, Kankles. So, if Stefano F draws a land, we win, yeah? Because this is 9 damage, and this Don't is... I got this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this is... Oh, that... That total ball sack. I don't care about my health even though in the slightest. Dang it. I'm doing this. Just getting the Teferi out of there, trying to fill the bins. Filling the bins. One time. Just draw a land. Stefano's drawn cards that do stuff for a few turns now. Oh my god! I am the luckiest bear in the world. Literally the best possible card for us. Look at this. Literally the best one. Welcome back. That Phoenix of Ash. Boom. This is a hell of a turn. Pump it up. Pump it up. Look at that. For the Xaxes. Oh my god. Just as when lands are good draws on turn 20. I have a very unique way to win. Alright, what is the boarding plan? Well, let me tell you. Ashiok Dream Render is an absolute Ashiok game ender. Bone Crusher Giants don't really have that many bones to crush. Um, is Farica's Libation a value card for us? Is it a value card for us? Probably not. This this seems like the Teamer Reclamation, Wilderness Reclamation... What the fuck? Wilderness Reclamation... Jeskai Fires type response. My opponent's just gonna be stacked full of junk in that trunk. This actually feels pretty good to me, Lily. Or maybe a Noxious Grasp. Something like this. We're just gonna run the 61 cards because you know what? We're, we're actually made of balls. You wish you were as brave as I was, huh? Running 61 cards, that's right. 61 cards with 25 lands feels excellent. 61 cards is the number to do it, man. The libation could make them overextend with the doom. We would need the stars to align quite sharply for that to make me happy. Um, and by that I mean like, was this a bad keep? Maybe this was a bad keep. Maybe I'm a bad man. Maybe I'm a bad Sean. Never mind, I'm the best Sean that ever lived. Um, if my opponent, for instance, goes Omen of the Sea turn 2, Oath of Kaya turn 3, Doom Foretold turn 4, things like that, it feels so bad. Farika's Libation becomes a dead card. And also, having us discard stuff is not actually that bad. Oh shit, I just got a music track from my buddy. Oh my god, music! Yeah! Howdy, howdy, howdy. Oh yeah. Amen has the biv to beat. Alright, let's do it. Turn 3 Kai. Turn 3 Oath of Kai. Come on. Turn 3 Oath of Kai one time. Golden Egg! <gasps> oh 
Okay. Scrawr! Feels good. This feels positive. This feels like an excellent. Excuse me. So many eggs. It's a very leggy, eggy time in life. <clears throat> All right, let, let's let's commence the Bing Bonging. Each player discards a card, huh? To the bin with you. Stefanov. Could have, like Kai's Wrath. No big deal if it happens. We just instantly replay Phoenix of, of Dad Ash. Not even a problem in the slightest. Mm, you love to see it. A bing, bing, bong. And then uh, we have Meyer Triton. To help us resuscitate our other Phonix friend. This feels so good. Ah, yes, dim for told. Goodbye. Alright, it's time to check out what's going on in this hand. Let's get that Dance of the Mance out of here now, huh? I just don't want to have to deal with that. Alright. Uh, 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 um. Gives them some ability to do some things. Keep filling the bin. Fill the bin, start to win. Dude, can you imagine if we just Ashiok and and slurp up the entire set of cards in exile? I mean, that's going to be good. That's going to feel really good. Their hand is straight gas. That's not the gassiest hand I've seen. That's we got some reactive cards, and we kill the only one that actually gives them any particular card advantage. You got it. All right, now I can just resummon this Phoenix. Ooh, you love to see it. You love to see it. I am going to deal the one damage and draw a card. It feels good to me. Feels like a good play to me. Good play to me, a good day to me. Stefano Efano. Is that is that a sad moment for me? It's a very sad stuff. moment for me. I bet you beat me. I'm gone for now, but not forever. Gone for now, not forever. No. Ooh, ow. All right. So first things first. Show me what you got. That one out. That one out. I think that's probably correct. A little bit of life gained. It's all good. I think I need to just keep forcing things and draws. It's a tragedy. That's all it was. It was a tragedy. Croxa helps. Ooh, look at this. Look at this. Pain bringing going on for Stefano F. Kraken for the Blacken. All right, let's see what Stefano Efano is going to do. We have, a, like, a Croxa, a Phoenix, lots of stuff is super good for it. Let's see two go to the bottom, you know? One on the top, one on the bottom. Well, that's not good. Graveyard. 
Procs off the top, you know what I mean? Procs off the top. I know my responsibility. It's the kind of play that seems ideal. I have a play. Let's just get the Crocs out. Let's just get the Crocs out and end it, huh? Just right now. Crocs in the bin one time. Ah. It's okay. 34 cards, not a Crocs was seen that day. Kind of feels like a Crocs of shit. Two bottom. Two top, zero bottom. Ugh. Yuck. I'll protect you. I'll protect you. Dispelling phantasms I can go. I can go down. It's not an issue. Another one of these. Ooh, gonna send this one back for the sweat. Oh, really? Is that the way we're going to do it? Into the bin goes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Bing, bong, bing, bing, bong. We are on the verge of victory. We are on the verge of defeat. This is a moment of tension. This is it. This is the this is the big leagues. This is a big moment for us. You and me together. Making our opponent discard shit. I'll be there. Oh, wait. I'll be back. Just you wait. A lot kills us. Let's try this. Oodles and oodles murder us. If this gets to three, this. All right, let's see if Stefano F sees it. Let's see if Stefano F sees it. Bounce this and just shoot me in the face. No, Stefano saw it. Wanted to exile my sweet zombie right before rubbing it in. That zombie cruelty. I'm not really feeling this e to extinction. Bring down the curve a little bit. Shit, we're still at 61 cards. <laughs> Why do I do this to myself, man? I was trying to be a hip, cool bro, run 61 cards, but instead. Mmm. Say yes to the duress. Oh, we already have our four key Landos. That feels good. I'm going to be calling the dead soon. And see you, um, goodness, later, alligator. Okay. Oh, one, two, three, four. I declare a fun, 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 fun war. Okay, we, we literally have just hit, like, a god opening. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. There is, like, no good play for Stefano F. Add eight more cards as just an economist. Ah, uh, yeah. Few things let the world know that I'm a sexy guy who knows how to be sexy than if I go to 69 cards. Our opponent, Stefano F, is going to plus this because if Stefano minuses this, the only thing to minus is the thing that helps us. So, Stefano may as well... Might be a bad idea.
I'm gonna leave the land there as a memory of how awesome this game has been turning out. The fact that there's a pair of Doom Foretolds in the bin right away is very nice. Shocking in for Oath of Kaya, very nice. Blood Crypt, Tim Rett Calls the Dead, very, very nice. That was, that was a subtle turn to mistake that Stefano F made, not playing the Godless Shrine, but instead playing the Hallowed Fountain. <gasps> oh my goodness gracious! Well, I'm going to do this first before I play Ashiok Dream Render. But we're, we're about to live that infinite phoenix life. Croxus. You love to see it, you know what I mean? You just love to see it. In response, I will sack Timrek Calls the Dead. I will then replay Timrek Calls the Dead. Ooh, yeah. Exile that. Hmm. There's too much awesomeness, man. There's too much success happening over here on this side. Stefano Efano has five mana, which is an extremely awkward amount of mana versus what we have. Because three mana would allow a Kaya to get created to exile the Croxus. I only get six mana now, but same story. There's like three mana removal cards. All right, never mind. We are in fact back at five mana. That wasn't my bad. Um, Etex Thongshan gets on out of there. <laughs> I'll go ahead and sacrifice this. Great. Oft ill-considered interactions. <laughs> Low cousin with the 83 months, man. We're rounding. We're rounding it out. Is that another? Is that another dance of the mats? Now I have a quick question. Did Sean Plot successfully do it all in the right order? You bet your butt you did. <laughs> Don't mill yourself, dude. I have 30 cards left, man. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in golden shape. I'm in ye old golden shape. Stefano Efano. Feeling like maybe he's done some goody goodness. We're losing Ashiok. Oh no. Oh no. Ooh, ooh, etc. Go ahead and play this. Cause the infinite Discardios. So let's get a spell, a planeswalker, a land, a spell, and a land. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah, let's let's sack that Doom for Toll. <whistles> hey, Stacko84 with the five sub gifties. Feeling quite nifties. Yeah, dude, I would love to I would love to revisit. That sounds great. Alright, well. We are going to play Croxa. It's gonna deal three damage. Gonna go to the bin. We're gonna play Croxa. We're gonna get the creatures and enchantments out of there. All right. So the only thing that wins the game for our buddy is precisely Kaya's Wrath. Sick. Boom. Pretty sick, slick little play. We're actually in some serious pain.
Gotta refill the bin. Fabled passages again, the nut draw. Oh, look at this! Oh, we're both working together to kill Stefano F. Look at the teamwork. You hate to see it. Well, it's all good. This is why we've been pretty diligent about not exiling these puppies. Best card in the deck to draw right now is absolutely Fabled Passage. Game's close. Game's very close. Oh, yeah. Oh, shock it in, shock it in. Ooh! How I wish that didn't get shuffled. How I wish. Mmm, yeah. Oh, yeah. You love to see it. For the lethals. Down to five. Feeling good. Playing this, getting some of this out. Ooh, not quite the lethals. Not quite the lethals. I was very close. Was very, very close. Straw. One land off the top. Land ball, corner pocket. Let's slow this down. Don't worry. It's close. It's closey dosey. Top deck wars. Timur calls the dead maybe. We just should have waited. I'm definitely trying to fill this bin, but I could have easily just waited a turn. Might be it. Here we go. Here we go. Taking pain, drawing one a turn. Omen of the sea. Yowzer dowser. Timrak calls the dead would be a really good one. A glimmer of hope, perhaps? Crocs is really good uh, to eventually cast, but for now, this is what we got. I think I gotta go for it. <laughs> yeah, I know. You got it. You got it, Stefano Fano. this up as I go. Another Kaya's Wrath. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's so funny, man. We're a little low on the Croxus. I think we have two in here. One, two, three. All right, we got three of our Croxus friends in there. Mm. Some, this is some edge of the seat action. Ooh, ooh. How about two bottom? Two to the bottom, Stefano. One top, one bottom. Wow. This is this is the moment of desperation. Will Will Stefano bounce the oath of Kaya to live another day? This is a close one, man. We are. This is some edge of the seat action. Dum da da dum dum dum. Ooh yeah. Get Stefano down to two again. Okay, this is actually just so good. I think we have to do it. 
really messes up the enemy's win condition. Now Dance of the Mance just like goes nothing. 12 cards left. All your shit's going into the bin. Twelve cards left, but he's got twenty-one. Probably gonna get murderous ridered, maybe. Nope. Nice. We didn't have enough mana to hit for lethal. We could have brought Stefano FNO down to two. Oh my god, it's Manbon! It's Manbon! It has been so long. Ooh, zero top, two bottom. Yes, please. Ooh, yeah, let's take a little pain. Get those cards in. Uh, down to two. Feels good. Man bot, I have not seen you around these parts in a million years. Man bot. Alright. How many phoenixes do we have? I think I should have one left. There's one. Okay, you got it. Doesn't do anything because I can immediately resummon it. This is okay. I actually think this is a good time to do this to myself. I am so good and so cool. It's so great to see you. Man, man Bon is a Fun Day Monday legend, man. Absolute Fun Day Monday legend. Whatever you gotta do, Stefano Epino. I believe in you. He has to have a murderous. I mean, maybe. In the exile is one, two murderous riders. Two, two or three is a pretty frequent. The number two and the number three are relatively frequent collaborators <laughs> with Esper decks. Thank you kindly, sir. So brave, little one. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, baby. <laughs> we won! We did it! We won! We won the game! Hell yeah. This, this can't do anything. Oh my god. What an absolute grinder binder. Alright, first of all, I put stuff into my bin. There, there's the escapees. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very satisfying series. How many cards left in the deck? Uh, two. Two cards. We have two cards left in the deck. <laughs> yeah, feels good. Play a few more with this one. This, this is a good feeling deck. This is a good feeling deck. That was a dramatic battle, too. That was a dramatic battle. I am going to get some fizzy water. Oh, he's got green shorts on. He's such a fashion icon.
we gonna hurt him now? I love fashion icon day nine. That's right, Phantom of Aries. Sean, I have an idea for you, Sean. Hear me out. You should have a fashion line. Hear me out, Sean. Now, hear me out. Sean, hear me out. You should also start a podcast to advertise your fashion line. <laughs> I waited a turn because Healer's Hawk and White Mana is a strong indicator that this is a mono-white deck that often plays a turn two Pride Mate so they can swing with the Hawk and then make it all big. Um, okay, so nothing here. This indicates to us that our opponent very likely has three mana plays. Heliod, Linden. Linden's the most likely one. Uh, oh, okay. Some alarm raising. I have not actually seen that used. Exile Timurit. Tier 1 sub, but I have the Twitch Prime symbol. Is that normal? Um, if you have ever used Twitch Prime, I believe that you are permitted access to that. Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. Do it. Okay, that's, you know, that's fair. Fair, fair, fair. Put the top three cars into the bin. Now we gain three life and we get to scry three. Okay, that's very, very, very good. For oop cuming plays. A one and a two and a three and a four and a five. I love Crocs so much. <laughs> Low Cousin says, how do you reconcile your love for the number nine with your love for the number five? I do it through my love of relative primality. Oh! These guys, they dies in the skies. You know, re relative primality is a rather useful concept. <clears throat> Two things are relatively prime. If they have no common factors. So, for instance, four and nine are both not prime numbers. But the only thing that four is divisible by is two. And the only thing that nine is divisible by is three. Someone make you a mistake. -y. And it, it, it's also uh, relative primality is really useful in number theory, but it is especially useful in uh, game design stuff. Because if you give a player things that divide evenly into one another. What? What, 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 okay. Well, I'll just get a phoenix into the bin and win that way, huh? very useful in design where if things divide too evenly it becomes too obvious for the player what to do for instance if dota was like a two lane game one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve yeah i did count correctly 
Like in Dota, you have five heroes divided among three lanes. There's no way to nicely evenly divide them. But if it was like four heroes and two lanes, two here, two there, very easy to divide them. So what do we not want? Well, obviously what we do want is Noxious Grasp, Disfigure, uh, maybe a Bedevil. Beat the Bedevil out of it. I think what we don't want is this Rankle, Master of Prankles. Uh, I think the Phoenix of Ash has a little bit of... Oh, sorry, the Ashiok is the, is the shittier one. I might actually want this guy. Invasives. It's like uh, in, when in mobile games you can never purchase the specific amount of fake currency that you need to get the thing you want to get. I think there's a lot of manipulative bullshit that exists in mobile gaming that totally does not need to exist because you should just figure out how to make a good fucking game. I don't know. It's really weird to me. I don't, th okay, th here's a thing that actually tilts me unnecessarily much. The reason that people play games for a really long amount of time is that it's good. It needs to be good. If a market is really crowded and you make a product that's good, then you're going to be fine. Let's not overcomplicate shit. And I feel like th th there's a there's like a, a broad unwillingness to just say that. Death to birds. Game needs to be good. And I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, this recently due to the fact that there are so... Counter-Strike has been doing such a good job. Oh my god, for like 20 years. It like just hit its highest viewership of all time. And guess how it did it. Prime day for justice. By being, by like being good. You, Do you understand? The game is good, it's a good game. And if you play it, it's fun. Does that make sense? I cannot tell you how over the years many people have heard say, well, you know, the problem with that game. Maybe I should have held back and waited for the bone crushing, but Meyer Triton is really good. The problem with the game is that the market forces and all this, uh, Counter-Strike. I've, I've heard the argument, Counter-Strike is, will never wind up being a successful game because it just, it unfortunately has that really violent implication of terrorist versus counter-terrorist, and because of that, it'll never really get a long-term strong foothold. It doesn't matter how much logic or reasoning you apply to something. If it's good, people will play. Let's talk about Player Unknown's Battlegrounds for a moment, okay? PUBG is a game that did not have any sort of interesting, iconic art when it was created. It was the least optimized game that has ever been released, save for Ark Survival Evolved. It crashed all the fucking time, for no reason, constantly. There were bugs galore, the hardcore simulation, uh, gunfire had all sorts of glitchy obnoxiousness, and that game hit over 3 million concurrence on Steam alone. Because the game's actually good. It's a good game. I don't know, man. I'm gonna, it's going to be Crocs time coming up soon. This is a pretty cute card to have there, huh? Yeah, I mean, My Minecraft is another great example. Like, Minecraft does not have this insane graphical fidelity. It's just like a really, really, really good game. Courage will bloom in all who seek justice. 
Uh, couldn't you kill the Gideon with Mire Triton by using Stomp while blocking Gideon with the Mire Triton? Uh, this says damage can't be prevented this turn. Stomp deals two damage to any target. This, uh, oops, this isn't Gideon. This says, uh, as long as it's your turn, Gideon Blackblade is a 4-4 human soldier with Indestructible that's still a Planeswalker. So even if I was able to deal damage to it, it's still Indestructible. My opponent... Yeah, let's keep Croxa in here. Are you fucking kidding me? Holy crap. Fuck yeah. Out I come. Oh my god. A Hushbringer when I have Croxa? Yes, please. Oh my god. Yes. I would love a two mana 6-6. Six, six. Wow, what a, by the way, uh, it's a huge mistake to run Hushbringer when your opponent has any Titan at all. Huge mistake. Huge mistake because then the Titan doesn't have to get sacrificed. I will do my best to support you. Is this a different one or the same one? Man, I actually think Elspeth's Son's Nemesis is going to be a beating for us this game. I mean, this, this is pretty sick. Let's get this one out of there. Ay, ay, ay. Or those can attack. This just plussing is probably going to win. This is amazing. If you are going to fight, fight beside me. I, this, you gotta be really careful with this card, okay? No two ways about it. That's about what I got. That's about what I got. I was talking about things being good. Oh yeah, like I find this sort of weird analysis when it comes to like mobile games, where there's this like, well, you know, the representation of how uh, of what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get as much freaking money out of this as humanly possible, no matter what. Period. One, two, three, four, five, six, and we are dead, huh? Healing back to zero. Dude, I think Elspeth's Son's Nemesis is a card I really overlooked. I thought it was kind of like, meh. But man, that guy's actually pretty dope. Get more targeted removal for those Planeswalkers. Um, but yeah, no, I just, I just see a lot of just like uh, mobile games that are so focused on trying to make some excuse to put in microtransactions that there's just like not a focus on the game and making the game good and like a good game you know what i mean like yeah if you come up with a trick that will get your users to spend one percent more dollars obviously if you have a billion dollars a year a one percent increase is pretty substantial so cool but like maybe we actually shouldn't spend all of our time Just trying to mash out 
these tiny optimizations if no one plays your game after a while because it's boring and bad. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? If the game's boring and bad, then like... Maybe people won't play it. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm crazy. Death to Meyer Tritons. But I pretty much feel like I'm fucking right. Croxa? No, oh, my air trike. Black mana? We're gonna play this? Maybe get a Croxa in there? Maybe not? <laughs> no attacks. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like... And my sort of argument um, around this kind of stuff is typically that a lot of the shell analysis is pretty easy to do. I think I don't care about that one, but I, I want to be mana efficient here. All of that's good. All of that's good, 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 good. Like, shell analysis of various things is way more easy to understand for your average bear. I'll do this, because this is a good way to get, like, multiple kills on things for free. Um, excuse me. I, I keep getting interrupted by the game, and I keep forgetting where I'm at. See, Phantom Varys says, it depends on your goal. Are you looking to make an absurd amount of money for little effort, or are you looking to make something good uh, people enjoy and like? Interesting fact about mobile games. Most of them make no money at all and lose huge amounts of money. You'll hear a lot of mobile games talk about revenue, because they'll have, like, 500 million in revenue, with 700 million in spend on user acquisition. Or like 500 million in spent on user acquisition. There's very little spent on the development and a significant amount spent on the... Opponent's hand, opponent's graveyard. Alright, this gets exiled. Oh, uh, actually it doesn't matter. It, these are actually equivalent operations. I mean, a lot of mobile games are basically saying if we can pump a billion dollars in and make $1.1 billion, all we need to do is just get a cheap, quick, easy, small as development cost as humanly possible thing. And there's, you know, Zynga for many years lost like billions of dollars just trying to do this, just trying to make this work. Like overall, like total cumulative. I haven't looked at their financials in the last year. I think they posted like a $15 million profit on a quarter. Hmm. Big Bird says, I don't understand the term user acquisition. Um, so, so the idea is, t take something like Magic the Gathering. Take this game, for instance. This is a game that I play for a long-ass time. The game is awesome. I keep playing it. I keep putting money into it. I keep playing it, and so on. When you look at what Wizards of the Coast is doing, they are clearly building a product around people like me. People who just want to keep playing a really rich, deep, cool, compelling, interesting experience. A lot of mobile games do not actually have that as their model for who the players are. 
the model is, this is someone who will pick this up, play it for a few weeks, maybe spend a few dollars, and then stop playing it. That's the model. And so, what you're trying to do if you want to make money is you you know that people only spend a few bucks in your things and play for a few weeks or play for a few months and stop playing. Because they will, very literally, run out of stuff to do. So what you can do is you can just say, hey, let's just pay a bunch of money to get as many people into this as humanly possible so we can make some money. So you might do something such as spending... In terms of the amount of marketing that you spend, you might spend $5 per user. So if you spend $5 to get a new person into your game... Yeah, I kind of felt that one coming, huh? Spend $5 per person to get it in. You kind of need them to spend, on average, like more than $5. Uh, we're, we we lost, right? We're, we're dead. We are the deadest. Yeah, I'm just going to concede. And so th there is excitement that a lot of people in uh, the industry have because, holy cow, we can wind up getting so many users in. Oh, my gosh. There's, a there's clearly a lot of money being spent by players. How do we get in on that? How do we, how do we get in on this, huh? How do we do it? Oh, and I remember the thing I was talking about before. I, I, my, my argument is that there is second layer analysis that's easier to understand. For instance, I have any game, any game at all. If I have daily login rewards, it will bump the number of people that log in every day. It's a really simple, easy way. And in terms of having a bunch of human beings that you're paying to get shit done, creative problem solving is way more abstract than feature implementation. Such as, guys, we need to get daily login rewards. We need to have this other thing that increases daily logins. We need to have this other thing that increases daily logins. You know, like a sale that rotates from day to day. We're gonna need one of those. We're gonna need um, kaboom leaderboards. Leaderboards are a good way to drive user participation. Let's get some leaderboards a going. I think it's actually okay to agonize and remorse here. We have an annex. We have a light up the stage. I think I can actually slow our opponent down enough over the next two turns to be fine. Grimrock Knight, yeah! Alright! These are easier to understand, and so they get implemented en masse. Uh, But I think that, like, in console and PC gaming, it's easy to sort of look out and go, good games are what people buy. And by good, I mean, like, rich, deep, interesting, compelling, like, 60-some-odd-hour experiences. Or, you know, like, 15-hour beautiful story-driven things, like an Uncharted game or something like that. Um... And I feel like, at some point, someone's just going to make a good mobile game. <laughs> at some point, eventually. I feel like someone has got to do it. Hearthstone is like a really good game. And it's on mobile. It's like a very good game. It's tight. I dare say it's tight, even. Red mana is fine. Mm, 
Get out of there. Still don't have quite enough. Another fabled passage would be the nuts. Uh, library. Ooh, I would love this. This is like the perfect kind of card, because then I can one, two, three, blow it up, and then I can play another one. And then we can exile Kropsa. Oh, come on! Get it out of here. Enter DXG says games are now like TV shows. They need to be really good now to capture audiences. They evolve with the times. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I remember over the last... I can't remember. Some number of years. Sean Bloom had been talking about this on Mostly Walking. And I uh, picked up reading some of the pieces that he was uh, referencing. Holy shit, an experimental frenzy. No freaking way. Well, let me let me just deal like a billion damage. Show me what I got. I'm gonna hang for just a quick second because DD Chaos Master can potentially just brick. Embercleave? Yeah, I remember Sean Bloom was telling me about just how many, like, incredible writers. Had been shifting over to television and how there was this big renaissance of, of TV writing that had allowed the creation of a lot, lot, lot of really good shows and a, re a lot of really just great storylines. And that this was causing overall TV viewership to increase um, sort of alongside this growth of all these other digital distribution channels. And it was fascinating to read about because, you know, it, it, it's almost more acceptable that, you know, it... The, the qualities that are going to make a, a television show succeed is going to be the quality of the writing, the quality of the showrunners and the directors, a lot of the creative side of things. And it's fascinating to me in mobile, the percentage of discussion that is about free-to-play mechanics, different business models, different non-creative things, and just how many games are like, you know what, we're also going to be a match three game. And it's certainly hyperbolic for me to be like, mobile games suck, all of them are bad. There's there's plenty of mobile games that are good. For me, it's more of the percentage distribution in terms of the discussion, in terms of like, you know, if, if you watch some GDC talks, a lot of business-focused uh, business talks exist. And a lot of the design-centric, here is how we did our level design in uh, Celeste, or here is how we did our stealth system in Dishonored, you know. Data-driven stupidity. Man, I love talking about data-driven stupidity. Well, I have good news for you. What I've... Ooh, this is actually a bad hand. Maybe I should have chucked this one back. Whoopsie, whoopsie. Whatever. I'm still going to win because I'm the fucking best. Sean, I have great news. I have a predetermined idea that I can confirm with this set of data. Groove Mancer says, here's how we get all the whales. A GD so GDC talk every year. Yeah, man. No, my land. No, I want that land. Never mind. I'm the best. I'm the fucking best. <laughs> I'm the absolute fucking best. Also, I think the difficulty of being 
creative is that it's more risky. You spend lots of money trying to be creative, but if you don't do it right, you'll get nothing out of it. Whereas looking at the uh, way mobile companies operate by saying, well, we, we can't do that because it's too risky, but if we spend this money in marketing, we, have, we can do X, Y, Z thing. Uh, okay, so the only thing that really bones us is infuriate. And I'm looking to overall reduce the amount of damage we take. So I'm just going to block here. Uh, if there's a light up the stage, you know, what are you going to do? But I, I think it's more likely that there's just another Rimrock Knight, given that D Chaos Master. Oh my god, I am so absolutely sick and thick. Um, yeah, I, I, I absolutely 100% agree that it is, and I'm going to stress this word, perceived as being less risky. There is a broad perception that, oh, phew, we mitigated risk by focusing on the actionable concrete statistics instead of the hand-wavy, touchy-feely kind of creative work. And let me actually build on that because... It's so easy to understand, make a daily login reward and bump your player base by X percent. By the way, are you seeing how sick these blocks are? How we're absolutely shutting down everything our opponent can do? Blocking and chumping with a first striker to fill the bin so we can... Croxa! Croxa! Crunched for lunched. I expect to see an Embercleave discarded. Eh. So again, I, I, it, it's so, it's so hand wavy, and like daily login rewards are just so concrete, they're so abundantly concrete. Um, but here's the thing: is that I view the creative skill set kind of similarly to the skill set of being a rocket scientist. If you are a rocket scientist who is pitching a novel way to use materials and construct in a particular way that greatly cheapens the development of frickin' rockets, the only way that someone can really vet if what I'm saying is true, if I'm just, oh, do we figure it out? So the only way someone can vet me is if they have some experience in rocket science probably a lot of experience in rocket science and um one of my favorite things I, I think i've been talking about this that when i go running i really like to listen to lectures about authors how they focus on their creative process of authorship and how they construct their business model because i feel like an author is one of the professions that is very similar to streaming in that I am one person doing creative output and an author is one person doing creative output how do they how do they evaluate their various thingies that they be doing. And, you know, in listening to the way that Brandon Sanderson, uh, I'm watching a lot of Brandon Sanderson lectures, Brandon Sanderson, the way that Brandon Sanderson is breaking down, modeling, describing, constructing how these stories should be told, a lot of the ways that that happens, nope, is very, very technical. Very, very robust structure. Very, very robust um, body of knowledge. And I'll be honest, when I first started listening to these, it like did not click a lot of what was saying. Die. We're gonna Timurut Calls the Dead. Uh, big word of warning for us specifically that we should be aware of in this matchup, Phoenix of Ashes, low value. We we're nearly certain that seeing the Simic colors and nothing done with three mana means that there's no two mana play, which means it should be land, cavalier of uh, big Ricci boys. Or Nissa, it's fine. Potato, potato. So Ashiok has a certain amount of high value for us. The land shall conquer you. All right, here we go. Bing, bang, pow, bada, dada, boom. 
and you know, uh, for for an author to understand and process this sort of complex set of problems that go into, I want to write a a book. I want to write a story. So these are the issues that I face as a story creator. With all of that um, being true, when when I think about a creative business like making a TV show, making a game, making a movie. It is really important that there are sophisticated creatives that have that understanding and body of knowledge. Who are like skillful at understanding that creative work. Um. The land fights for us. Okay, what's happening here? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it requires, in any of those creative fields, people with a certain level of sophistication of the creative elements need to be involved in that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, stop. None of these are really going to help us very much, huh? And I think that, like, when there's examples of really awesome, talented creatives in areas like film that consistently knock it out of the park. Like, you know, J.J. Abrams or Joss Whedon are names that come to mind that, like, that they're, they're sufficiently talented at this that they continuously produce good shit. Uh, Brandon Sanderson continuously produces high-quality epic fantasy. Um, Stephen King consistently writes the ever-living fuck out of books at a rate that I don't even understand. <laughs> and some of them are, are worse than others. But by and large, the guy fucking knows how to write, man. Shit. And um, Bud Mons is something that I think is, is undeniably important as a follow-up to recognize, which is creativity is more subjective than sciencey topics in the end. Absolutely. Um... That's absolutely true, but there are lots of ways to make what feels like it should be subjective and make it objective. Um, you know, and, and, and a simple example I'll, 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 I'll use is if I tell a joke, and we got we got three thousand people tuned in right now. If I say, let's say it's a a mildly offensive joke, some percentage of you are gonna laugh at the joke and enjoy it. Some percentage of you might laugh at the joke but be like, "Ooh, I didn't like how that was. That was a little bit. That was a wee bit crass, Sean." Some of you are not gonna laugh and be offended. Some of you won't get the joke because you were watching Netflix and weren't really paying attention. Some of you will be just asking me questions about Magic the Gathering and don't really care about the joking because that's not, that's not why you tuned in. You tuned in because I'm clearly a superior Magic the Gathering player, huh? Can't wait to exile all this shit, you know what I mean? Mmm. That's gonna detonate our board. We're looking more than likely dead. I'm just going to concede for simplicity's sake. So, like, when I, when I have that joke, I have this spread of reactions. I have this spread of reactions that helps start to give me a way to objectively evaluate what's going on. And someone can say, well, some jokes are just other people find jokes funny that other people do find funny. You know, it's all about fit, and it's all about the subjective taste. But if I am, for instance... Uh, if I simplify this and say, if I say a joke to 3,000 of you and 100 of you laugh, and then I say a different joke and 1,000 of you 3,000 laugh, one of them had 3,000 people laughing, one of them had 100 people laughing, and let's assume that these are completely different groups of people. There's no overlap in the Venn diagram. What would this indicate to us? We would be able to say a pretty concrete statement that this joke and this joke appeal to different peoples and that this group is larger. 
Those, those are just objective statements, just clean, clear, objective analyses. And this is, you know, some of the detail work why people talk about playtesting being so important. Brief sidebar, Bone Crusher Giants are not going to be good here because there's essentially no one uh, or two health things except for Risen Reefs. We're going to put in the Noxious Grasps, which also do hit Risen Reefs. Uh, we also, I think I kind of want to get some of the, the big ladies in there. A Bedevil seems good and Ashiok seems good. Uh, Rankle hurts a little bit because Cavalier of Thorns owns the shit out of it, and it, it, it's not particularly effective against some of these large board situations. So I think that this is a good sideboarding plan. Um, th th this is part of the reason why in playtesting it's so important to get different groups of people and, and here's the important one, you know what you're looking for and what you're trying to test in the test. If you put someone in front of your Dark Souls-like level, you shouldn't just say, what'd you think? You should be saying, okay, I think that players should spend about this long in the first area and after the first area, they should understand the combat. The second area should be a little bit of different scenarios to kind of get someone comfortable with the different stuff that they should do. And section three should be the real challenge. So I want it to ramp up and then afterwards section four, it's easy again and we want to make sure people feel a sense of triumph. This allows you to concretely do something like, wow, in section two, Turns out that people did not really get the combat when they got into Section 2, so there's something wrong in Section 1. There's something going wrong in Section 1. Uh, or maybe Section 2's difficulty spiked way too much. Or maybe when uh, you got to the very end of Section 3, where the players beat some big boss, then fuck, they were exhausted afterwards. Man, how do we make sure that people aren't exhausted afterwards? What's exhausting them so much? Maybe it was just too much intensity for too long? You have these concrete things that you're actually trying to measure. Oh, look at this. Do I want to trade? You betcha booty I do. I have had so many games against Simic that go precisely like this, where I just put on some very mild pressure and then play a Liliana on turn six and just absolutely eat him up. Who's, who's my little buddy? Hi! Goodbye! <laughs> wow. Absolute bone crushing, huh? Oh, I thought it was. It's like a counter spell? Are you serious? Negate? Whoa, somebody is lost their mind. Hello. Hello, who's my buddy? Is it Despy the cat? Are you the buddy? Yeah, you're kind of annoyed at me, huh? I'm going to have to start turning on my air conditioning a little bit. Damn, that stinkers. Into the bin, 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 into the bin. Oh. All right, we're, we're actually looking for some, for some different tools for us. Like, we really kind of want an Ashiok. I don't even know what I just hit. Oof, that's not the one that we wanted. My game lagged out for a second. This is okay. It's not particularly good though. I think it's time to Lily. If I were you, rise and shine. Chumps. For bumps. Are you a good cat? Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is... There, there are little lies that people... I, okay, so I find the idea of working on something creative 
to feel really similar to when I would try to practice for tournaments in StarCraft. Where I have a general sense of kind of the gist of the strategy that I'm going for, and then I do lots of tests to try to see where it's strong or weak or what's good or bad. Draw, draw. Oh, where were you last turn, you bastard? This is not... Things are looking a little dire. feels very much so like these little tests that you're doing and the vague general idea of the strategy, you know, the vague general idea of the creative product is starting to come into focus. You're starting to realize what's wrong with it, where you might need to completely abandon a plan and so on and so forth. Um, and I feel pretty strongly that they're, they're in the same way that people tell little lies to themselves when they're practicing a game. So, too, there's little lies that seems like people tell themselves. Oh, does this just own my Croxa? Well, I mean, there's a lot of two-cost things here, so we should be okay. Titan, who wore it better? Ah. Don't worry about it, Despy. Everything's fine. Like... How many people have you heard say, you know what, at my MMR, the way I play Dota, people just don't get how to deal with it as, like, my teammates don't understand how to work with me, so really, it's actually pretty sophisticated what I'm able to do. These cards are all coming, like, one turn too late. <laughs> Book. Really, if I were at a higher level, they'd really understand. It's a, it's a fit thing. I have heard a lot of people who are, uh, uh, say, struggling with hosting or presenting or with streaming just say, well, it's, it's that what you and I are doing are different, and I'm just going for a different style. And it's like, okay, there is such a thing as different styles, but there also is such a thing as, like, be, being worse at this shit. I think, I think we've lost. I think we've lost. I think we've lost. Victory. No one ever remembers. Why can't I hold all these croxes? This player, actually, I probably still need to keep filling my own bin if I want to have any hope of recasting shit. Sure. Maybe we can actually do something next turn. Having a big 6 6 is pretty dope. But I mean, I feel like, 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 if, if I'm if I was criticizing a StarCraft player who was trying to improve, there would be things like focus on your fundamentals, build workers. Stop telling me your cool strategy. Just build workers. Do one thing. Do the exact same thing every single game. You don't get to participate in strategy. This is a hydroid crisis, motherfucker. You don't get to participate in hydroid strategy. Did I say hydroid strategy? Damn, my brain's mixing all sorts of stuff. You don't get to participate in high level strategy in StarCraft. Unless you're building enough workers, period. That's what, build your damn workers. Step two, start looking for the first mistake. The first mistake in every game. Start looking at the very first mistake. Start looking at that. Step three, make sure you have plans for continuing to get more expansions. This is a game about taking bases, okay? How, do I, how the hell do I win this game, huh? Like this. And then what I 
I do is I attack with this. Twenty-six cards left, twenty-six cards left, and then I do this again. Okay. Right? Like, I would also, um, ask, you know, I'd have, like, a list of questions I'd be asking. Like, are you doing this? Are you doing this? And are you doing this? And I literally spent, I made, like, thousands of videos of educational content about StarCraft. And, and I have done tons of, like, education and coaching and researching of, like, low-level players. Um, don't care. You did your job. Good work, Ashiok. And you'll get players who are like, yeah, no, I know that I'm making, uh, I'm missing out on my SCDs, but what do you think about the rest of my strategy? And I'm like, I don't think about it. I'm not thinking about it at all because it doesn't matter. Build more workers. Never, never, ever, ever miss a single worker production. Ever. Period. Second thing, let's look for the first mistake. People keep analyzing after they've done a crippling error at the outset of the game. Who cares? If you don't make that first mistake, you won't be in this later mistake. People have all these little kind of bullshit excuses that are in there when it comes to to learning. And I'm not, I don't want to stress, I'm not talking about who would get a higher MMR or any of that or like, oh, actually, that's another thing that people do where they're like, well, I... I don't know, because I heard advice from someone who was in Grandmaster League that that's what they did. And I'm like, okay, dude, you, 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 you got supply blocked. This is not, <laughs> we objectively know that this is bad. And, uh oh, vigilance and trample till end of turn, huh? I think we're dead. And, and I say this because I feel like w when people work on creative projects as well, you know, like a game, they'll say things like, well, no, I mean, like, so-and-so found it fun. Actually, there's no way we, we live through this. You got me. All right, you got to move. Ah! Actually, I'm going to turn on my air conditioner, and I'm going to switch decks. And I'm going to get coffee. Hey! Hey! Get out of here. Get out of here. All right, well, actually, get get over there. When a lot of people creatively look at their game or their product in the same way that people are unwilling to make harsh statements to themselves about what's going wrong with their gameplay, I think it's very easy to not make harsh statements with yourself about whatever creative thing you're doing and being unwilling to make an objective statement, just to, just to chalk it up to subjectivity. If you didn't get the joke, it's because it just, you just weren't the audience for it. Sometimes that's true. A lot of times it's not. Let me tell you, when you stand in front of an audience and you make what you think is a joke and nobody reacts, you really start to feel how objective things like humor and timing are. <laughs> you don't get to explain your way out of that one. When you sit down to a game of StarCraft or a game of Dota, and you are doing your, your subjectively cool style, and you're getting fucking murdered, it starts to really not feel so objective. And when you apply some objective analysis to telling a joke, or objective analysis to telling a... Uh, working through a strategy, or objective analysis to doing some other creative project, like writing a book, or making a game, or writing a script, you'll have some pain, but you'll get better. It's good shit. It's four o'clock. I'm going to take a micro break. I'm just going to uh, use the restroom real fast, get some water, stretch my legs a little bit because I've been sitting for three hours consecutively, and I'm going to turn on the air conditioner. We'll be back. We're going to switch up decks. I love that Croxa deck, but I'm going to go back to Sultai Ramp because it's fun.